Okay, so last Sunday in Genesis chapter 1, we heard how God created the entire universe. And he did that from nothing, just by speaking, just by commanding it by his word. Now today then, as we move into chapter 2, it's as if we're, we're zooming in, zooming in on the creation of man and woman in the garden. That's our title for this morning. So in a way, chapter 1 was like the painting of the entire, the whole canvas, with verses that move very, very rapidly through creation, through the creation of everything, absolutely everything that exists. But now, as we move into chapter 2, we're treated to, we're treated to the detail of how God painted just one portion of that, of that canvas. The first man and woman are our first ancestors. In chapter 2, we, we actually were, were jumping back into day 6 of creation that we heard about last week when, when God created every land-dwelling animal. But now we're given more detail about the beginning of, of humankind, the very first human couple. In Genesis 2, we're, we're given a view of the world from a very, a very human perspective and especially of human relationships within the world as God intended them to be. So as we mentioned last Sunday, by by day six, it's almost as though the rest of the creation is is waiting, waiting for the arrival of of human life. Everything seems to have been been moving towards this point. As we watched, as we we looked on last week, as we heard how, how a suitable habitat for human life, well, all life, but particularly human life, how that habitat was formed stage after stage. So look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. The seed-producing and, and fruit-bearing plants were created, we're told, on, on day three. That's what we heard in Genesis chapter one. They were created on day three along with all the other vegetation. But it seems, from what we're told here, it seems that they had not yet sprung up. They'd been created. They were in the ground, bursting with potential. But they hadn't yet grown, or, and they certainly hadn't yet produced, uh, produced any food. And why was that? Well, we're told at the end, well, we're told that, we're told for a start that it it had never rained. But then, well, that wasn't the problem because verse 6 tells us that that the land was watered by mist or or by by streams. So no rain, but there was mist and there were streams. So that wasn't the the problem. Now, at the end of verse 5, we're told that it's because there was no one to work the ground. So what was missing? Well, the answer is that man was, man was missing. Creation was waiting for him to arrive, waiting for him to be, to be responsible for it and to bring more and more of it under, well, under his rule and, and to bring more, of, more and more of it into productive use by working the ground and by caring for the, for the earth. Now you're probably thinking, boys dear, that's a big job. He must have been busy. But soon we're going to find out that, well, it all starts on a much more manageable scale with a garden, the Garden of Eden. This garden that was then to expand outwards from there as as humanity uh, multiplied. So this is the situation into which and, and for which man was created. Therefore, it's, therefore it's very fitting in, in verse 7 that whenever we're told that, we're, that we're, when we're told how this first man was made, that it was from the dust of the ground. He was to work the ground, and that's where he came from. So he really can be considered the first earthling, quite literally, because earth and soil, that was his very humble origin. However, he is also a living being. And his life comes directly from the Lord God, who formed him and breathes into him the breath of life. Now notice that there's, there's no mention of God breathing life into any of the other creatures that he formed. 
So yet again, mankind is not just another animal. We're made in God's image, made as his, his representatives, and we possess life which is different from that of the animals. And in that we are, we're made with a spiritual dimension as, as part of who we are, a part of us which enables us to, to enjoy relationship with God in a, way that, in a way that animals can't. So already in these first few verses, we, we already have so much that we ought to give, give thanks to God for. Now we often talk about the world that God created being a perfect place. But biblically speaking, biblically speaking, the world at the beginning was not, not perfect. It was good, but it wasn't perfect because in a, it, it remained incomplete and, and, and uh, unfinished. Perfect in the Bible means, it means good and finished and, and, and complete. It wasn't any of those things. Well, it was good, but it wasn't yet complete or finished. So, for example, there's, there's clearly a contrast in these verses between, between the world in general, which was waiting to be filled and, and ruled over, compared to the garden in verse 8, this garden which God planted in the east, in Eden. Now, gardens are, are usually, I say usually, they're usually orderly cultivated places. And even more so if that garden is planted by God. And there in the garden, God causes beautiful plants and, and fruitful trees to grow. So whenever, whenever Patricia was reading those verses for us earlier, did you, did you spot that God isn't just interested in, in functionality, but also in the splendor and the, and the beauty of his creation? God builds incredible beauty into his designs so that even the plants which are for, for food, even those plants are attractive to look at. Now I'm sure all of us can think of times when, we, when we've been blown away by the sheer beauty of the creation all around us. So let's make sure that we, that we thank our awesome God for this amazing world in which he's placed us. This world that he's given us. And, and well, we're going to be doing that next Sunday when we come to our harvest service but don't you don't have to wait that long don't let this day pass without thanking God for this world in which we live but what we have here in, in Eden what we have in Eden is is literally very literally a, a microcosm a, a, a miniature version of what the rest of the world would become as mankind worked the ground, starting in Eden and spread out from there as, as humanity multiplied. In a way, that seems to be what, what is depicted in, in verses 10 through to 14, when we're told about the river which, which watered the garden and then, and then flowed out of Eden, split in four, and flowed through various, various parts of the various different lands. Lands which are described as containing gold and, and precious gemstones and, and fragrant resins and probably more besides. Now these, the descriptions were given, they, they paint a picture, a picture of a world that's ready to be explored and ready to be enjoyed by mankind. So at this stage, the future certainly looks bright. Next then we need to look at these, we need to think about these two trees described in the second half of verse 9. We're told they grew in the middle of the garden. One was the tree of life and the, and the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now what we, what we need to realize is that, that these trees, especially the, especially the latter, would provide our, our first parents with the opportunity to, to display their, their obedience to God. It's often been said by putting these trees in the garden, God created a kind of, a kind of testing ground, giving the, giving the ongoing possibility to demonstrate love and trust in God. And there's certainly a lot of truth in that. In a way, it was a, a testing ground. Now, there's no indication of, well, no indication that either of these trees possessed any magical or, or spiritual power in and of themselves. No, it would be God who would take action 
to bless or to curse, depending on what our first parents do in regard to this, uh, to the second tree. So yes, these two trees were, were marked out by God as, as special, but not magical. And they do force us to think about good and evil. One of them, after all, is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and good and evil, that's our, our next heading this morning. So look at verses 15 through to 17 again. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, who's still at the stage, he's still alone. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now this Garden of Eden, it isn't, just a, it isn't just a microcosm of the world as it should be under the rule of man. Now at the same time, it's also, a, it's all also a, a miniature version, a microcosm of the kingdom of God, with man living in faithful dependence on his creator. Mankind was living in a place planted and, and prepared especially for him by God living in relationship with God and, and living under God's rule because, well, he was, because God had given them these two commands. Eat anything you like except this one tree. Because he, he had those two commands, he was living under God's rule. And that was the way in which he would demonstrate his obedience, his faithfulness, his love for God. Now, he was very clearly experiencing God's blessing in this beautiful, abundant garden. A garden which contained everything he needed, everything that was needed to give him life and, and, and purpose. The man was to work and keep the garden like a, I guess like a park keeper. We, we don't say them or think of them so often today, but in the past, parks had, had park keepers. And so... Just like a park keeper, this man's job was not only to look after the garden, but to be in charge of everything that happened there. That was part of what it meant to, to exercise his rule. It's part of, of the role given to the man as God's image bearer, God's, God's representative. However, however, although the man is to rule, he does not have what we might call moral authority or sorry, moral autonomy. In other words, it's, it's not that he doesn't know there's such a thing as right and wrong. He definitely does. And it's not that he doesn't know the difference. He clearly does. No, it's that, it's that the man must not presume that he can decide for himself what's right and wrong instead of God. That's what we mean by moral autonomy, deciding for himself what's right and wrong. And that's something he most certainly didn't have, didn't have. You see, it's God's job to tell us what's right and wrong, and it's our job to obey. Now, although to modern ears that might, that might sound unacceptable, it actually leads to the best and, and most satisfying, the most liberating life that a person can live, which really shouldn't surprise us because it's the life that God created us to live from the very beginning. No, it's whenever we think that we can decide right and wrong for ourselves, that's when it all goes wrong. And experience shows us that. Our own, and right back through history to Genesis chapter 3, which we're going to be thinking about in, in two weeks' time. But in verse 17, God warns that, that eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would result in death. Death which is firstly spiritual, and later, physical, too. Spiritual death, which is being separated from God's love and favor, to live, to live as his enemy instead. And physical death, which is the death of our bodies. Now, both, both would be the result if man broke this, this one rule, in a sense, rewriting it for himself to, to allow what God had forbidden. So let's pray. Let's pray that God will help us to, help us to leave the, the rule-making to him and help us to focus on, on obeying what he tells us 
is right and wrong. Now, there's going to be more about that in, in two weeks' time. But last Sunday, last Sunday in chapter 1 of Genesis, over and over again, we heard how, how God was pleased with all that he had created. And he said that it was good. But now here in chapter 2, verse 18, for the very first time, we, we hear God describing, describing something as, as not good, which is that the man is alone. Verse 18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him, literally corresponding to him. It's not that the man is, is lonely. That's not what this verse says. Now, whenever God looks at the man, he knows it's not enough. God knows that the man on his own is, is incomplete. Something more is needed before humankind is, is finished. And only then God could call it good. And it is God who describes what's missing as, as a helper. Now, to us, that might, that might seem demeaning. It might sound like this helper is less than or, or lower than the man. But in fact, helper is a word that's often used in Scripture to describe God himself. And he's certainly not lower than, than us. Often God is, is Israel's helper, strengthening them in, in times of crisis. And even in the New Testament, when we read about the Holy Spirit, helper is, is one of the titles, one of the descriptions that's used for the Spirit. So what this man needs, what Adam needs, because this is the, this is the time in our English Bibles that, that Adam's name starts to be used. Now what this man needs is not someone to serve him, but someone to strengthen and complete him. Literally, literally a helper corresponding to him. Not to be, not to be his clone, but his complement by making up for his weakness. And by compliment, it's a compliment with an E, not compliment with an I. Now it's at this point that all of the animals and all of the birds are paraded before Adam. And, and well, not, even though many of them could do things that Adam couldn't do, Nonetheless, none of, them were, none of them were a good match for the man. They weren't what he needed. Now, of course, God, God knew that beforehand. He knew that that was the case. But doing it this way would highlight just how suitable, just how suitable his match was when one was found. And this is the time, that, time whenever Adam gave names to all of the different creatures which, as we've seen before, naming something indicates authority. Now, what the man needs is a woman. None of the animals can complete him because he needs more than the strength of an elephant, more than the, the speed of a horse, more than the sense of smell of a whatever. And neither can, neither can what he needs come from another man. We see that from what God does next no, Adam needs a woman. And the account of how God made the first woman is given to us in, in verses 21 and 22. Whenever God causes Adam to fall asleep, removes one of his ribs, and, and then uses that rib to form a woman. Now, it all sounds, all sounds quite bizarre. It all, quite, all sounds quite strange. But the significance of doing it, doing it this way is explained for us in Explain for us in Adam's own words in, in verse 23, where we read the, the, excited, the excited, joyful welcome that, that Adam gives to this woman. At last, says Adam, in effect, at last. And then he goes on to say how although this woman is separate from him, she's part of him. She shares his very essence. She's, she's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And yet she's not a man, but a woman. That was what Adam names her. And I remember what we've said before, what we've heard before about naming. Lastly then, the, the, the closing verses of this chapter provide us with the foundation for all that the Bible says about, all that the Bible teaches about sex and marriage. For starters, it was God 
It was God who created sex, who made sex. And so sex and sexuality, like all of God's creation, is good. It's from what, it's from what verse 23 explains, that the very act of sexual union stems. And it's for the same reason, says verse 24, that people separate from their parents and then unite in marriage. And the rest of Scripture, sexual union, sexual intercourse, is always seen as, as recreating the one flesh pattern that we see here in, in verse 24, which is why sex is only ever for those who are married, not before marriage or outside of marriage, only for those who are married. And it's why marriage is meant to be lifelong between one man and one woman, just like here in, in verses 24 and 25. Now, that, that remains an, un, an unchanging truth, regardless of society's attempts to, to redefine marriage or to undermine marriage in countless other ways too. So it really should come as no surprise that when our first parents are this first human couple, when they were living as God had designed and intended them to live, their nakedness, their, their sexuality, it brought no fear and no shame. This is the, the wonderful scene at the end of chapter 2 with Adam and Eve enjoying, enjoying each other, enjoying life in this beautiful garden and enjoying fellowship with their creator as they help each other to serve him. In other words, we have God's people in God's place, living under God's rule, and enjoying God's blessing. I'll say that again because it's significant. We have God's people in God's place, living under God's rule, and enjoying God's blessing. That's the ideal that these verses paint for us. And the rest of Scripture, well, tells us how things went wrong and how God had a plan to get us back there. But for now, let's bow and let's pray.